I, I think this is okay. So, shout out to the Global Health Corps, who are a group of young, well, relatively speaking, from my perspective, young people who don't know that what they actually are doing is impossible, so they just do it. I just love that. Okay, so. Uh, Working across cultures, what matters, what matters to you, cross-cultural communication. Uh, this is what we're going to be talking about. Um, I think the way I figure out this group is about 50% of you are actually going to be living and working in another culture, and another 50% are going to be working with people in uh, from other cultures. So you're all in the mix. You all have these, this... Uh, kind of challenge ahead of you, um, which is good, you know. And so I want to get the idea about culture sort of out of the way and, and uh, talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing, a little bit about who I am. I've got some information, pieces of information, but most of the session is going to be doing stuff, which is really fun. And the, the reason we're going to be doing stuff is that when you really want to explore culture, you really have to dig deep. Uh, culture is like an iceberg, one of those really common symbols used in Africa, <laughs> the iceberg. Okay, so it's like you see it from the top of the water, right? And it's like this, and you're like, oh my gosh, look at that big iceberg. But the, but the, and that's like in culture, that's like what people wear and how, what language they speak and what food they eat and how they live. They're in the houses and the buildings and stuff like that. That's what we see with our senses. And then in an iceberg, like the whole action is under the water, right? And that, a lot of that is below awareness, below consciousness. And so when you're exploring your culture, you want to kind of dig deep. And, and the best way to do that is to have experiences that kind of pull out what you really think, what your values are, what the assumptions that you make. It's, because you know, everybody knows their culture, but they know it in the sense that if somebody violates your rules and assumptions, you have a reaction to that. You almost don't, you often don't know, even know why you've had that reaction. So just a little bit about the Global Health Foes Program. The one thing you should get from this is our website, ghfp.net. The, the, the Public Health Institute is my home office. It's in the San Francisco Bay Area. I work in Washington, D.C. It's where most of the project is. And here are our partners, and you'll see the Global Health Core. This is a common configuration in the business of international development, where there's a bunch of organizations that are coming together and partnering. I've read your bios, by the way, so I know that this is an awesome, awesome group awesome group, stars, all of you. And because you're stars, my guess is that a lot of you sit here thinking that you don't deserve to be here. You know, just like you, someday they're going to find out about you and they're going to march you out the door. Yeah, I know that feeling. Um, I do a ton of coaching in my work, and I have worked with super senior government executives and global health stars and Nobel Prize winners, and I'm always amazed at the, um, the inner suffering around doubt that comes in. So I just want you to know you're not alone if that is something that's on your heart. Um, so the purpose of the Global Health Fellows Program, and it's not a small program. My annual budget is about $35 million. It's a big program. A lot of that, almost most of that goes to fellows salaries, fellowships, two to four years, a lot of internships. And that's why I want you to be aware of this website, because all of our, all of our offerings are on our website. All of our recruitment is done online all over the, for all over the world. We have a lot of fellowships in Washington and a lot in the missions. And we have some in NGOs and on, in other foundation offices and WHO in Geneva. So they're sort of all over the place. Uh, and w why USAID wants, that, wants us to do that is they want to bring talent into their own company, new ideas, but they also want to help build the next generation of global health professionals 
which is what the Global Health Corps is all about, which is why, you know, we're, we're really good, um, we're fans. I'm a fan, okay, I'm a fan of the Global Health Corps. Okay, so how are we gonna spend this time? You know how it is, I noticed, you, I was here yesterday and noticed that people were writing a lot, and you know, I have to tell you, you're not gonna remember, and a lot of that stuff you're not gonna ever refer back to. Do you have like handouts and notes from other sessions that you sort of store away and then eventually you get rid of? I know, it's like, I'm guilty for sure. I do the same thing. Um, but I believe that there's very little that actually sticks, even in a dense day and in dense events like this. So I, I'm just shooting for maybe one or two ideas that you're gonna, that you're gonna, that are gonna come back up, that you, oh yeah, I know that, or that's a new idea, or I used to know that, and now I've remembered it, that's interesting. So that's my goal. We're, how we're gonna do it, how we're gonna get there is an overview, which is like where we are right this second. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what it takes to be a successful global health profession. I've been working with a bunch of universities through the consortium of universities in global health to figure out and I have the identity at this point as a, an employer of global health professionals. I spent a, the first 14 years of my career in cross-cultural adjustment and communication. I lived in Japan. I did my dissertation studying how Americans adjust to change. That was really fun. And then I moved into global health uh, and I worked at in uh, Frank Anglophone Africa for a, a decade. Um, really looking at uh, behavior change communication and client provider interaction. So I know a lot about that piece. And then the next career was performance improvement and training. And then the last 13 years, it's been about how do you support people as they evolve as professionals in global health. Um, so we're going to do, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about competencies, then we're going to do a, an act, a couple big activities, and then we'll see where the time is. Uh, I uh, don't want to take more time, and I believe that this is as much as you need or want at this point. So we'll just get some, some conversations started. So five key global health competencies. Ah, uh, yes, what does it take? First one is interpersonal effectiveness. It's the one that your academics least prepare you for, and it's the one that is the deal breaker in your professional life. I am the legal supervisor of all the fellows, and they're straight out of school with masters all the way to professor emeritus, world-class expert that USAID wants to bring in for a couple years. The fellows that I have had to fire, always it's been about this issue. And this inter interpersonal effectiveness is about your cultural savvy, it's about being able to collaborate, being able to work in a team, and in a group. You can be the smartest person in the world, but if you don't know how to do this, uh, you will not be successful in this career. And then more and more, the, this work is done in alliances. And that's one of the things I really like about the Global Health Corps, and don't let you get away with just being in your head and being like super smart. You guys are all smart. I mean, you're, you know, you're like, a, you're already the elite. Now you have to do the heavy lifting, which is the wisdom of being able to work in these groups and working with people that are different from you. Collaboration, teamwork, ch change management skills, <clears throat> all those things make a difference. Resource optimization. This is another area that, I, that I'm not convinced that uh, academic, academia does a great job, and this is what you wanna pay attention to in this field experience you're having. Resource optimization is basically, you know, figuring out how to do as much as you can with very little, right? And so uh, funding mechanisms. A lot of people want to be fellows in USAID, which is the largest international development donor in the world, because they want to figure out how the money works. How do, how, how do you get funding? How does it all, like, who do you talk to? 
What, are, what, what is a good, a successful proposal looks like? Is that what you do? What, when, how do you know what, where the money's flowing? What are the big donor strategies? And so that is a very important piece. When I was living and working in Tanzania in global health, the Ministry of Health, or the government of Tanzania, paid for 6% of the health system. And the rest was paid for by outside donors. And outside donors have their agenda, they have their strategies, and so you have to kind of figure out who's on the ground in Tanzania, where is the money coming from, what is their agenda, and how do you leverage that for the NGO that you're working for. The biggest issue right now is capacity building in international development. And I'm sure you've been hearing this, and you're going to be working on the ground, so you're going to be seeing this. And as you're working in the NGO, wherever you're going to be, think about if all the donors walked away, how could this organization survive? What could they do? What does their infrastructure look like? How dependent are they for ideas and for resources on other people that they in the end, may not be able to count on. And that's the, and by the way, nobody actually has the answer to any of that. It's like the Wild West right now. So you are like entering in at a very exciting time. We're not quite sure where we're headed, but we think it's generally in the right direction. Okay, health expertise. This is the easiest thing. This is the technical stuff. This is the reproductive health and family planning, HIV, and all the permutations of how HIV can, you know, the technical parts of it, um, nutrition, infectious disease, um, health systems reform fits in this category. It's like these being able to drill down into these technical areas. Also, special populations, MSM, men having sex with men, youth is a big one, um, women of reproductive health age, uh, grandparents. There have been whole projects on the influence of grandparents, you know, the auntie, um, tribal village elders, there's all kinds of different populations that you can target, sex workers, sons of the, sons of the president, it's, it's another like a whole uh, focus area of, um, of behavior change. So there's all kinds of different uh, health expertise, behavior change and communication, gender, blah, 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 I could go on and on. And it's like changes all the time. So. The, the only thing that's going to matter for you is what you love. Like, what, what excites you? What technical area excites you? What population is just, what, what population breaks your heart? And that's going to be where you want to, where you want to go and you want to dig deep. Okay. Professional capability, or capacity, sorry. This is, do not make an ass out of yourself in the office, okay? Do not do it. Follow the rules. Do your timesheet. Dress appropriately. Um, don't harass people. Um, don't be a drama queen. Oh, my God. It's, it really, I'm telling you that if you can manage your wisdom and, and your self-control, self-regulation, I know so many people that are brilliant that hit this professional ceiling and nobody's willing to say to them, it's because nobody wants to work with you. You just cause trouble wherever you go. Don't be one of those people. Don't be one of those people. Um, also writing. I want to really reinforce the importance of writing. If you're a good writer, if you're a clear writer, many, many sins will be forgiven. Even if you don't say, you know, even if you're not brilliant, which of course you guys all are, but really if you're not, if, if you're a clear writer, they like, they ascribe all kinds of talents and wisdom to you that you may not even have. And I just want to apologize to all the Africans because we're asking you to be a great writer in English. When we can't even begin to speak the three languages you speak bef besides English. But it is a real key. And those those LMIC professionals, lower and middle income country professionals, who are good writers, you can write your own ticket. If you're a good writer and if you are able to connect with the American culture or the Dutch culture or the, you know, whatever donor culture is, is operating primarily in your country, 
you can write your own ticket because that is rare. That, is, that makes you very special and very popular and very, very marketable. Knowledge management.
Okay. So those are the things that matter. In a, and of course, there's lots of different, you know, there's like 350 different competencies. I just those are the things that over time have seemed to matter to a small group of us that are trying to influence academia to help better prepare you for what the real world is like and also to influence donors to understand what is what is needed and what, what success looks like from a performance point of view. Okay, so we're going to get back to the cross-cultural activities, okay? So we're going we're gonna to do something first. And it's looking at, the thing about culture is it's very dynamic and contextual. And things that are true in one instance might not be true in another. So what I'd like you to do is get into pairs. So just identify somebody that you're sitting next to whom you're going to do this activity with. So that means eye contact and selection. And people on the end or in corners. OK, everybody's in two, a pair. Everybody has a blank piece of paper and a pen or pencil for every team of two persons. OK, now one rule is very important. You cannot talk. What was that rule? You just talked. No, I just kidding. I just kidding. That was really okay. That was just mean. All right, that was mean. I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, so during this activity, you cannot talk to each other, and just go with that. Okay, you're gonna want to, but you can't. All right, all right. So all you have to do is draw a house. Take the pen, both. Hand, both of you have the pen in hand together. You both have your hands on the pen, and you're going to draw a house without talking. Now, now, now we're going to process this. Simple activity, right? Very simple activity. You collaborated. You drew a house. It's unbelievable how much went on in that short interaction. Two dynamics I'm going to pull out, and you decide how that played out for you. The first dynamic, which always happens below consciousness, it's always contextual, is leader-follower. The leader-follower dynamic. Now think about your experience in this moment. Who led? Who followed? How would you share the role? Talk amongst yourselves. Is there anybody that would like to volunteer a little bit to tell us what that dynamic was? How, that, how did that play out in your pair? So for us, we, we took turns. So I think I, I think I drew the sort of first part, and then he took initiative to make it a 3D drawing. And it, we went back and forth a number of times. So how did you know when the, when the leadership was passing back and forth? I don't know. I think we were both willing to not listen to each other, but sort of listen to what the other person was doing in terms of pulling. And the second I felt him sort of having an idea, I let go and let him take control. And then when he sort of slowed down, I let myself take control. And Was that how it was for you too? Yeah. That was his time. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, she, t she took the lead before, and, uh, and I realized when she was hesitating, I have an idea on how to continue, and she took her part to, to build a window, and I took my part to bring in also another angle, so I thought we were perfect. <laughs> Over here. Yeah, um, I really think this was really a good work. Uh, I took that lead, and uh, I was so happy that he was following whatever I was doing, uh, taking the hand here, and it was really so submissive to this, and he was taking this. <laughs> yeah, he, he was like, the, uh, he did not have any, any kind of um, uh, complaint about what I was doing. Uh, he liked the house himself, and he's like, yeah, 
uh, apart from he wanted a chimney up and uh, <laughs> he, he, there's no way he could communicate that, but really worked out so well. And it's like, yeah, it's really great. So what I learned about this is uh, even if you're taking that lead, you know, when someone uh, really gives you the opportunity to lead them through, it really works out well. For us, the interesting part was we both did the outline of the house together, no problem. And then when we got to some of the other structures, you can visually see where we were fighting against each other. To try to, like one of our windows is a little squiggly because we were both arguing which way to go. Were you and arguing, how, how did you know you were struggling? Because I could feel her pulling and me pulling at the same time. And, yeah, and then we were awkwardly laughing towards each other, but it was also like no one wanted to let go of the pen. So. Oh, yeah, pen. yeah, but after that, I think, I, there were some parts where I just let her do her thing because I just didn't know what she was doing anymore. <laughs> so I want to add another dynamic that also operates below consciousness a lot of times, and it's task versus relationship. Okay, so what was your natural goal in the interaction? Was it what was happening with your partner, or was it getting the job done? Getting the job done? Getting your job done? I trusted my partner to do the outline house. I figured she's pretty competent at that. Um, thank God neither of us are architects or going to architecture related positions. Um, but she drew, she drew a very, we had a very cute tiny house. Check it out. Look, look how, it's ecologically um, sound. Um, but I, I realized after she drew the house with the windows and the doors with the knob that it was missing a chimney. So I feel like I was able to contribute the chimney piece um, so we didn't gas ourselves in this tiny little house. Yeah, so. very good. Other thoughts? Task versus relationship, leader versus follower. In a simple little activity, it all comes up. Well, I guess I was struggling to figure out who was gonna be the leader and the follower. And I figured since I had the paper and the pen, then <laughs> Was it you, I, you contributed to paper? Right. So you're like the donor, okay? <laughs> it's your paper, it's your pen, and you're going to, it's like what you want matters. Okay, right. got it, got it. And I had this idea of, okay, I could drive this basic house or I could go 3D. Let me see where, where she guides yeah. me. So I drew the basic house. My mom is an artist. The skills kind of skipped me, but I, I knew kind of what kind of house to draw. So I just went with the basic, but she did guide me on the chimney. You allowed her to guide you. <laughs> That's true, because I had the pain. Any other burning comments? Yeah. Yeah, uh, for me, I have an issue where I really need to just sometimes step back and let other people take control. And so I've been hyper cognizant of that this week, even though sometimes it doesn't work out so great. And so I let my partner take the lead in the beginning, and we ended up with this beautiful roof and, and house. And then we went to make the door, and so I said, all right, you know, maybe I can come in and start being a little bit more. And so we have this beautiful. Uh, triangular door. I'm not exactly sure how the hinges are going to work on that. Um, so that turned out great. And then once we had the basic structure, we kind of agreed on this window. And then I uh, made a little tree, which I think was quite confusing. But that's how the Very kind good. of the leadership dynamic ended Very up. Very good. So two things I want to say about this. We're going we're gonna to move on, but keep the, keep the point that you wanted to make and make sure you share it with somebody at, at some point today, maybe around lunch. Um, I first did this exercise as a fellow at the East West Center in, where I spent the summer in Hawaii, which is like a real hardship post, and if you can get it, you should really try it, it's really great. Um, and the person I was paired with was someone from the, um, Pacific, uh, the Pacific Rim, one of the islands, who's very tr who was a very traditional headman. And he was trying to draw one of those long houses on stilts, and I'm trying to draw the American, oh, it was a disaster. It's really bad. So uh, that happens less than, I've noticed over the years, this was in the 80s, and I've noticed over the years that t the style of the house tends to be this generic kind of Western house, which I don't know, I find a little disturbing. So I was happy that somebody was trying to do a, another kind of house back there. Because there are a lot of different ways that houses look in, in different countries. So the other thing I wanted to tell you that I've actually, I've actually never shared this before, but I've done a, f a lot of leadership development within the federal government, uh, one through, the, through PEPFAR, the you know, President's Emergency AIDS Plan for AIDS Relief, 
and also through the Foreign Service Institute where they get uh, all the generals and all these presidential appointees come through there. And I've done this activity there. And I, for me, what has come, what I've learned is that in all of leadership development, all the skills, all the behaviors, all the exercises and all of that, the absolute most important thing in leadership development, in, in true leadership, is an awake inner observer. It's, the, it's that part of your brain, it's not the inner critic, you know that voice that tells you you're not good enough? It's not that voice. It's, the, it's something behind your personality, behind your character, that is always open and observing you. And that awaken or observer, and I know that uh, Still Harbor gets this too, and they pay attention to this, and they're helping you pay attention to this through journaling and that. It's, the, it's where you went as you were processing the activity. It's like, well, what did I, what did I want to lead? Did I want to follow? Did I, what, what mattered to me? Was it the task? Was it, if you can bring that, that observer up, more as often as you can in the in the course of your daily life, that's the source of all wisdom, and you'll be able to manage the 200 emails and the crazy people, and all of that will will be l much less stressful for you. Okay, next activity. This is a very simple activity too, and it's the last big one we're going to do in this in in my time with you. It's called the parable. And you want to get out a piece of paper and a pencil, but you're not going to pair up with anybody at the moment. And I'm just going to tell you a story. So your job is to listen to this story. It's only a couple paragraphs. But what you're going to do, there's five people in the story, and what you're going to do is rank the characters in the story. The one who's, number one is the one whose behavior you most approve of. And number two, three, four, five, to five is the person whose behavior you least approve of. And if you've done this activity before in some other setting, it doesn't matter at all. Just go ahead and do it again. You'd be surprised. Okay, everybody listening for the characters that they most approve of and the ones that they least approve of, and you kind of prioritize. Okay, so um, I'm going to read this twice so you can get a really good feel for the story. Okay, Shakiba, first character. Shakiba is a woman of about 21 years of age. For several months, she has been engaged to a young man named Charles. The problem she faces is that between her and her betrothed, or her fiancé, there lies a river. No ordinary river, mind you, but a deep, wide river infested, filled with hungry alligators. Shakiba ponders how she can cross the river. She thinks of a man she knows who has a boat. We'll call him Sinbad. So she approaches Sinbad, asking him to take her across. He replies, yes, I'll take you across if you spend the night with me. Shocked at his offer, she turns to another acquaintance, someone named John, and tells him her story. John responds by saying, yes, Shakiba, I understand your problem, but it's your problem, not mine. Shakiba decides to return to Sinbad. She spends the night with him, and in the morning, he takes her across the river. Her reunion with Charles is warm, but on the evening before they are to be married, Shakiba feels compelled to tell Charles how she succeeded in getting across the river. Charles responds by saying, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last woman on earth. Shakiba's absolutely devastated, heartbroken. She goes to her lifelong friend, Kim. Kim, hearing the story, is very angry with Charles, the fiancé. Now, Kim is a black belt in karate and is well known as a great and ferocious fighter. 
Kim goes off to find Charles and using karate gives him a terrible beating. Ta-da! <laughs> okay. Shakiba, this second time I'm reading this. Shakiba is a woman of about 21 years of age. For several months, she has been engaged to a young man named Charles. The problem she faces is that between her and her betrothed, her fiancé, there lies a river. No ordinary river, mind you, but a deep, wide river infested, filled with hungry alligators. Shakiba ponders how she can cross the river. She thinks of a man she knows who has a boat. We'll call him Sinbad. So she approaches Sinbad, asking him to take her across. He replies, yes, I'll take you across if you spend the night with me. Shocked at his offer, she turns to another acquaintance, someone named John, and tells him her story. John says, responds by saying, yes, Shakiba, I understand your problem, but it's your problem, not mine. Shakiba decides to return to Sinbad, spends the night with him, and in the morning he takes her across the river. Her reunion with Charles is warm, but on the evening before they are to be married, Shakiba feels compelled to tell Charles how she succeeded in getting across the river. Charles responds by saying, I wouldn't marry you if you were the last woman on earth. Shakiba is absolutely devastated, heartbroken. She goes to see her lifelong friend, Kim. Kim, hearing the story, is very angry at Charles, the fiancé. Now, Kim is a black belt in karate, is well known as a great, ferocious fighter. Kim goes off to find Charles, and using karate gives him a terrible beating. So you want to make your choice. <coughs> number one, who you most approve of. All the way down to number five, the person you least approve of. And when, when you have done that, look up. This is not a trick, by the way. It's no right answer. Okay, just saying. Okay, so let's just get a, let's just get a quick survey of the group. Um, Shakiba, most approved. Charles, most approved. Proudly put that, put that hand up proudly. <laughs> Sinbad, most approved. <laughs> oh, Sinbad. Sinbad. Ah. I don't know if that's ever happened. Thank you. We have the lone guy. John, most approved. Kim, most approved. <laughs> All right, okay. Another round, least approved. Shakiba, least approved. Putting their hand up, yeah. All right. Charles, least approved. People are like, my hand is up for that person. Okay. Sinbad, least approved. Okay. John, least approved. Kim, least approved. Okay. So now we pair off the least and then we fight. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put you in groups of the people that you most approve. The, okay, so if you most, and this means we're going to like make a mess of this room. We're going to be moving all this stuff around, so you want to pack up a little bit so you don't lose your stuff. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to put, if you most approved of Shakiba, you want to go to that end of the room. Now don't move yet. I'll tell you, 
If you most approved of Charles, you want to go to that end of the room. If you most approved of Sinbad, come up here and talk with me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to mount we're going to mount a defense of Sinbad. Oh, I'm ready. Okay. John, this side of the room. You most approved of John. Kim, you're going to go back into that corner. Now go ahead and do that and then I'll tell you what your task is. You're all in groups. Y'all know what group's in? No one's allowed to leave. It's forbidden to leave the room. <laughs> okay, here's your job. You're going to talk about why you chose that person, and then you're going to select one person who's going to address the other groups and try to persuade them to change their minds and join your group. So do you, does everybody understand the task? It's going to be very hard with the larger group for everybody to get a say. So just do your best. You're going to talk about, as a group, you're going to talk about why you chose that person, why you most approve. Then you're going to select somebody to speak for the group. And they're going to try to, we're going to give the mic to them. They're going to try to convince the other groups to join you. Any questions about the task? I'm going to give you about 10 minutes, which isn't much, so go forward. Everyone listen with an open mind, an open heart, or with disdain. <laughs> there you go, man. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rama Talai. And um, so our group pretty much had really strong points for and against everyone. While we don't condone a lot of the different qualities that were presented, um, we chose Kim because we thought she represented a lot of the things that we would hope somebody would do for us. So she definitely um, represents justice because you know you see that something's wrong, and you act, for, you know, in that, in favor of that. And also loyalty. You listen to your friend's story. You understand the things that she went through and the reasons why she did a certain thing for the love of somebody else or for the betterment of somebody else, and she's turned away. So, like, how would you feel if you were? Um, in Shakiba's situation, you're doing something because you love somebody, you trust someone, and then they turn their back against you. So if you are Kim, you're Shakiba's friend, and you see how your friend is at this moment, you will do whatever you can to make sure that her love is regained, even though he, she beat um, Charles down to a pulp. <laughs> but hopefully that will get him to realize that, you know, she really loved me, and that's why her friend is here, to make me see that this is love. Um, and also, you can't punish someone for being trustworthy and loyal. And so Kim is kind of encompassing all of that and making it visible to us. And so while you know, she didn't need to be physical about it, she could have been vocal. Because I think you can still beat someone to a pulp with words. Um, uh, so just keep all of that in mind and realize that um, in an unjust world, Really, we need people who will have to stand and fight for us so that we can love and live to the happiest we're able to. Thank you. Great. Well done. Okay, John. Kim, did you guys decide Kim was a woman or a man? A man? So, who... Who, who, what, did, what picture did you create in your head, man or woman? Woman. woman. <laughs> hey, Kim, Kim, I know it's ambiguous on purpose. Could be man or woman. So anyway, I'm just, just notice, okay, notice what the gender you put on that uh, karate expert. Okay, John, who's speaking for John? Thank you. I can't live up to that, Ramatulai. That ending was beautiful. Well done, well done. Co-fellows, friends, colleagues. You have two minutes, all right? I'm here today to present the logical choice, John. In our group, we said that John listened, he was neutral, he didn't profit off someone else's problem, and he might have even empowered Shagiba to make her own choice when faced with this issue. 
But even if, you, even if you disagree with any one of those points, or multiple of them, for us it boiled down to the fact that John might have caused indirect harm, but he didn't directly harm anyone, and everyone else in the story did. Shakiba, even though she did what she needed to to get across the river, slept with someone else when she loved somebody, which is probably not the best thing to do. Kim beat someone to pulp, even if she did it vocally, that's not very nice, not, not a good thing. Charles, not very sympathetic or forgiving, not ideals that, that we support, obviously. And Sinbad, I don't really need to talk about since he's kind of, <laughs> kind of the scum of the earth uh, in the story. So we believe, as co-fellows, as Global Health Fellows, that if we can do good for someone, we have a moral obligation to do that good. So we dislike John strongly, we just dislike him the least. Okay, so who's next? Oh, Sinbad. We need a spoke. Oh, who's champion? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm probably in the trickiest position of all, and I hope that after this I retain most of your friendships. Um, <laughs> well, my presentation and our team's position is very simple, that if you decide to take um, only one side of the story, you're definitely going to condemn Sinbad. But we thought he had some very um, undisputable attributes. First of all, he was very honest um, and said exactly what he felt. And then he gave a choice. And so whatever transpired that night was very much uh, exhibited the highest levels of consent. Um, perhaps the strongest um, attribute that Sinbad expressed was that he kept his promise while everyone else reneged on theirs. After that night, he indeed uh, took her across uh, the river. And so we find that he was the most, sorry, the least morally responsible. Now, there are also doubts to the story, and this is where you need to question every story. We're not sure that there was sex after all. All we know, all the story tells us, is that he asked her to spend the night with him. We don't know if Sinbad knew the purpose of the trip. We don't know if he knew that she was going to meet her fiancé, so that could have sort of put him in a tight moral position. But he didn't know. It could have been a leisure trip. She didn't exactly explain it to him. <laughs> now, we find that all the other individuals compromised except Sinbad. Kim chose the wrong victim. If you were going to kick us, you'd probably have kicked Sinbad, but he kicked Charles. Charles failed to keep his promise of marriage. John wasn't reliable, and Shakira simply compromised. Thank you. Charles. Who's our champion for Charles? All right. For us, we wait for Charles on the following issues. We see Shakiba as somebody who is not trustable. Charles felt cheated and calling off for a wedding with somebody who is, who is cheating you is a right thing to do. You never know what she will do next. <laughs> Shakiba seems to be ready to do anything. What if somebody tells her something that can result in you being killed? Will you live with such kind of a person? Another thing, we look at uh, Shakiba, the time that she took without explaining to Charles that she slept with somebody. It was right, just, just uh, a minute or some few moments before the wedding. Why couldn't she say it earlier on so that the discussion could have been done well in time? Because Charles would be marrying somebody with issues in, in his heart. So we felt that no, Charles was right. And calling off a wedding when you have issues with somebody is not a problem at all. You'll face it. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well done. Okay, Shakiva. We have a person or two to, okay. <laughs> okay, um, I'm arguing for Shakiva. I want everyone to reflect a little bit. Um, we're gonna go back to when we were 21 years old. How many of you when you were 21 made a mistake? I know that I did. I think a lot more of you actually did than you're raising your hands. <laughs> Um, so we're going to present some reasons that Shakiba was actually not really as much his fault as some of the other people who have come up here and talked about. Um, the first main one is that she really made the best out of the situation that didn't allow much option. Um, if you are engaged to be married, your lover is across the river, I mean, what can you really do um, besides kind of make the choices you need to make to get to that, get to the point to get to reach your lover? Um, and I mean, in general, all of us really make um, um, really complicated exchanges every single day. So when, whether it, for us, I think it's not as big of an issue as it is for Shakiba, um, because we obviously have access to a lot of more things than she did. But when you're in a low resource setting or with a lot of, not a lot of resources and you need to exchange food for sex or drugs for sex, though we probably don't exchange drugs for sex that much here, um, <laughs> that is obviously an issue. Um, I think another really important part is that love is blind. Um, how many of you, of you have seen Moulin Rouge? Raise your hands. Um, as you know, love is a many thing, and it's a wonderful thing, but it does make you blind. And I think, especially when you're 21, um, that's a big factor. Um, and I think the last thing is that um, it was kind of a means to end. Um, we're not really here to judge commercial sex, sex work. Um, we're not really here to make decisions about who she was as a person. Um, we're here to support her as a person um, and make sure she makes healthy decisions. Um, so I actually know for a fact that she got a condom before she went over the night. <laughs> Um, so she was totally fine. Um, and I suppose the last thing is that even though she didn't tell her lover, Charles, immediately that she was unfaithful to him, or maybe spent the night braiding his, um, Sinbad's hair, we don't really know, um, at least she told them before they got married. So she has a lot of honesty, um, she is really resourceful, and she's using condoms, so that's great. So. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, listening to these uh, very good presentations, uh, anybody rethinking their choice about person most approved? OK. From what to what? Shakiba to Charles. Excellent. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of unforgiving, but I don't know that I would be different than Charles. If, okay, very you know, good. That happened to me. All right, changes. Yes, from Kim to Sinbad. Kim to Sinbad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I really think he's really not the worst, but I think he was more honest about. Uh, I give you this, you give me this. So yeah, and we don't really know what transpired. Okay. So yeah, Sinbad. Okay. A couple more examples up here. Um, from Shakiba to. Sinbad? Sinbad was my number two to start with, so it, it wasn't, I think, that dramatic turnaround. I changed from Shakiba to Kim because I think uh, Kim like represents all the women. I, she fights for people. She sees, she wants to stand up for people that are in weaker positions and she will go to extremes to make sure that Justice prevails, so I moved to Kim. <laughs> okay, one or one or two more, back of the room. From Shakiba to John. Oh. Okay. Do you want? Do no, I explain? Do you, only if you want to say. Um, I feel like um, I, just thinking about it. I think he did the least wrong. Very good. Okay, thank you. So. Just be aware of what the values, what values were playing out in these choices for you. Because you had to prioritize kind of what was, the choice you made about the character is a choice you made about certain values that you felt, certain behaviors that you thought were better than others. And the reason this story is so useful, I think, in this group is because you work in global health, 
And a lot of the health behaviors that we work on, reproductive health, family planning, HIV, when you're actually talking about the behavior, you're often talking about sex. And sex is really loaded with culture and values and rules and expectations, and it's very complex. And the very, very least thing that you need to know is kind of where you stand in all of that and how your own opinion and, and your own kind of unspoken rules. And the, again, the more you can bring that up to awareness, your own personal awareness about what operates and what's important for you, uh, the more important. So just in the last minute, I want to just recap what we did. First, we started this session at 8.30. I shamelessly promoted my own project. And then we talked about uh, competencies, what it takes to be a, a successful global health professional. And then we drew a house. And then we heard a story and made some selections about values. Also, I just wanted to point out that the people who stood up were really good. And you guys went into the insider-outsider group dynamic immediately. When you, when you sort of clapped for your, your guy, right, and you were really happy when somebody went to your group. It's so amazing how fast that dynamic operates. Okay, so turning it back to you, of this 90 minutes, what's the one idea you're taking with you? That might, you actually might remember it, or you were, you, something you knew, you kind of come back up, or some new idea. Yes. I think for me, doing this story, it just reinforces what we talked about yesterday, that there's not one single story to every issue, and that you don't know all of the details behind everyone's decisions. So I think that's really important to remember going forward. It's sort of a caution of, around not jumping to conclusions. Great. Yes? Uh, yeah. Whoever. Whoever has it, it's fine. OK. Do you want mine? OK. Um, yeah, and going along with what she's saying is that um, you can't assume that everyone has the same assumptions as you. Um, I, I think I, I came into the Shakiba group and was like pushing the don't victim blame argument and that wasn't something that was completely shared. Um, even though normally that general sentiment is shared, but in this story it changed. So, you know, when you're building, you're writing assumptions about a story you have to really collaborate and hear what other people are assuming. Great. Okay. Final comments. Oh. Yeah. Oh, over here. I think um, I think I'm still a little unsettled by the support for Sinbad, only because the word choice was made, and there's clearly a power dynamic, and so I'm not sure that Shakiba chose to sleep with Sinbad, as people said. Mm -hmm. Just like if I'm holding a gun to you and I say do this or this, it's, not a, it's mm. not a true choice. So I would just say to mm. always consider the system instead of just the individuals. Mm -hmm. So the activity was a bit unsettling. That's interesting. Okay, last, last comment. Um, personally, for me. Oh. Okay, last two comments. Okay, personally, for me, I, um, sorry here. <laughs> Um, I felt that, uh, personally for me, I feel like uh, I, I make judgments uh, yeah, I and I, I realize I make judgments very quickly and I stick to my judgments and it's very hard when I see other people also making their own judgments and then realizing that I should not judge them because of the kind of judgments they make. So trying to like tell myself that over and over again. Yes, we do a steady stream of judgment constantly in our heads, don't we? Constantly. Just kind of notice. That's all. Don't judge. Just notice. Okay, last comment. Who wants to have the last say? Okay. Yes, madam. <laughs> um, for me, as we shared the story, the thing that constantly comes to mind is emotional intelligence. And uh, not, you know, as you work with the people in the community, yeah, to work with them, but also, uh, um, also questioning our emotional attachment to them and how we help them, and also be in their stories, but also be professional, yeah. I want to say thank you for being such great participants. I really had fun today. You're very inspiring to me. Thanks a lot.